Hi everyone, Mrs V here and today we are going to talk about a very interesting group of compounds, the aldehydes and the ketones. I love talking about chemistry that's related to everyday life. I think it really brings chemistry alive. So let's get our PowerPoint on and learn more about these fascinating compounds. Right from the title slide, we can see that the aldehydes and the ketones are present in an enormous number of everyday products. They're used as both artificial and natural flavorings in the food industry. Again, we have both natural and artificial fragrances for the perfume and the aromatherapy industry. They are present in your body as hormones. We preserve biological specimens in them. Such a myriad of uses. When we look at the physical properties of aldehydes and ketones, we're gonna start by looking at their odors. So aldehydes and ketones with short carbon chains have strong, unpleasant odors. They are used mainly as solvents. And we see here nail varnish remover and just acetone you can buy generally as a universal solvent. Formalin solution. If you, you may have seen biological specimens sitting in jars. The solution that they are preserved in is called formalin. It's an aqueous solution of the aldehyde methanol, and it's an excellent disinfectant, and that's why it's used as a preservative for biological specimens. Ethanol is used to make resins and dyes, plastics, also preservatives. Acetaldehyde is thought to possibly cause the effects of a hangover. It's produced by the metabolism of ethanol in the body. The longer chain aldehydes and ketones, however, have really pleasant flowery odors. They're found in essential oils in plants. They're used as flavorings. We see the benzaldehyde the compound that's responsible for the flavor of bitter almonds. Then we have two optical isomers of carvone. The R isomer is present in spearmint oil and is responsible for the smell of spearmint. The S isomer is responsible for the smell of caraway seeds. And over here on the right, we have one that's near and dear to my heart, vanillin. I'm a big fan of the vanilla ice cream. It doesn't matter if it's natural vanilla or if it's artificial vanilla. This vanillin is the compound that's responsible for that flavor. We have a lot of use of the aldehydes and ketones with the flowery fragrances in perfumes. So we're gonna learn more about the um, Coco Chanel story later in Chanel number no. five. Physical properties are responsible for melting point, boiling point, and solubility. And of course, they arise from the intermolecular forces in aldehydes and ketones. So aldehydes and ketones can form hydrogen bonds with water, but they can't form hydrogen bonds with each other. So that leads to the aldehydes and the ketones having, low, having higher melting points and boiling points than alkanes, but lower than alcohols because of no hydrogen bonding. So if we look at this table, we can see that we have an al alkane, an aldehyde and an alcohol of similar molecular mass. And of course that's important so that we have consistent dispersion forces. And therefore we know that we can talk about the dipole-dipole interactions or the hydrogen bonding affecting the physical properties. So for an alkane that only has dispersion forces, we see a very low boiling point, negative 42 degrees Celsius. For the aldehyde that has dipole-dipole attractions but no hydrogen bonding, we have 21 degrees Celsius as its boiling point. And for ethanol, an alcohol that has dispersion forces and hydrogen bonding a much higher boiling point of 78 degrees. As far as solubility in water goes, you can get hydrogen bonding between the oxygen here, the oxygen on the aldehyde or ketone and the hydrogen on a water molecule. So you get 
it's quite limited hydrogen bonding really, but it is possible. And that leads to there being some solubility in water for aldehydes and ketones that have very, very short carbon chains. But for those with longer carbon chains, the dispersion forces start to have more influence on the properties of the molecule. And you'll find those being insoluble in water, but soluble in the polar solvents. Oh, sorry, the non-polar solvents. All right, chemical properties. This first one, is the silver mirror test is a test for the presence of aldehydes. We saw in our oxidation of alcohols video that aldehydes are formed in the first stage of oxidation from primary alcohols and that those aldehydes are extremely susceptible to oxidation. So even a very mild oxidant is going to be able to oxidize an aldehyde. And here we're looking at um, the ammoniacal silver iron. Great name, the ammoniacal silver iron being able to oxidize an aldehyde. And this produces a precipitate of metallic silver. And we see over here in the diagram what a positive test looks like. The positive test, which would mean that an aldehyde is present. You actually get this beautiful precipitate of silver that can coat the inside of the test tube. So it looks absolutely spectacular. A negative test, you just get nothing. So this is what you would observe for a ketone, but also for an alcohol. So it wouldn't matter if it was primary, secondary or tertiary, you would still get that negative Tollens test or ammoniacal silver nitrate test. Of course, if mild oxidants can oxidize aldehydes, then you would expect that strong oxidants can also oxidize them. So this is a great way to tell between aldehydes and ketones because ketones are not easily oxidized. So aldehydes are very easily oxidized by acidified dichromate ions. And you will see a color change from the orange dichromate to the bluey green chromium three plus. So this would be a positive test, what you'd get if you had a positive test for an aldehyde. But of course, remember that would also work for a primary or a secondary alcohol. So this is not a way to tell aldehydes apart from primary and secondary aldehydes, um, alcohols. So this would be what a negative test would look like. Similarly, if you have oxidation with acidified potassium permanganate, if you get no oxidation, so a negative test, then you'll, re you'll actually retain that magenta color, but a positive test, the magenta colors lost, then you end up with that generally a brownish color solution or a colorless solution. When it comes to the uses of aldehydes and ketones, this is where things get really interesting. So methanol or formaldehyde, as it's commonly known, it is used in formalin solution, as we already mentioned, a 37% solution of methanol in water produces formaldehyde, or sorry, formalin. And we can see here that we preserve biological specimens. So here we have a human brain being preserved in formalin and also a shark being preserved in formalin. And so interesting, it's also produced in the manufacture of some viral and bacterial vaccines, in which case it's used to inactivate the virus or the bacterium so that they don't, the vaccine doesn't cause the disease. In everyday life in foods, the flavorings and scents that are made from aldehydes, we have cinnamaldehyde, the odor of cinnamon, we have vanillin, 
Okay, isolated from vanilla beans can also be produced artificially, but it gives a vanilla flavor. We have geraniol, an aldehyde that gives a lemony odor that can be isolated from lemongrass. We have citronellol, which also has a lemony odor and is also from lemongrass. We have car the carvones, the optical isomers in caraway seeds and spearmint oil. We have zinger zingerone. This is the hot component of ginger. We have ionone, which is responsible for the odor of freshly picked raspberries, violets, and also sun-dried hay. And here's one, if you, you can pause the video, go and make yourself a snack of butan and dione, which is responsible for the buttery flavor of microwave popcorn. In the perfume and aromatherapy industry, these essential oils that are extracted from plants that have these beautiful odors are put together in various combinations to make different perfumes. So down the bottom here, we can see a few aldehydes, heptanel, naturally occurs in clary sage, it has a really herbaceous odor. Octanel smells of oranges, nonanel smells of roses. Dodecanel, dodecane is 12 carbon atoms, that smells of lilac or violets. And of course the perfume industry is always looking for that special combination uh, that makes a you know, world beating perfume. And a really interesting story about this is the story of the development of Chanel Number no. 5. Aldehydes had been used in perfumes since 1905, but it was when they were used in Chanel Number no. 5, which was released in 1921, that that really you know, brought aldehydes onto the scene in the perfume industry. So the story goes that um, Coco Chanel's perfumer actually accidentally added too much aldehyde to one of the samples that he was preparing for uh, Mademoiselle Chanel's um, examination. And he actually got that solution to almost 1% aldehyde. It was a total mistake. She loved it. The rest is history. And she named it after the vial number five that that was in. In the beauty industry, we see the um, use of dihydroxyacetone, okay, which is a ketone that's actually used in fake tan products. Okay, it starts off colorless, but when it reacts with amino acids in the skin, it, pr it produces brown substances and therefore gives the appearance of a tan. We have retinol. This is a form of vitamin A. And that's actually used in anti-aging skin treatments. When it's oxidized to retinoic acid, that can actually stimulate faster skin cell turnover, which gives a more youthful appearance to the skin apparently. It's used in sunscreens. We have avobenzone, which is a UVA filter in sunscreens. Um, on its own, it actually destabilizes when exposed to light, and that means its effect at blocking um, UVA rays doesn't last very long. So it's often paired with other things. Um, we also have oxybenzone, which is found in broad spectrum sunscreens, helps filter UVB and the shorter UVA rays, can actually make up to 6% of a bottle of sunscreen. Um, has been found that that ingredient contributes to coral bleaching. And in some places where you snorkel on a coral reef, you'll actually be asked not to wear sunscreen to be allowed to snorkel there so that you, your sunscreen, the oxybenzone doesn't damage the coral. There are plenty of examples of these compounds in your body. Retinol that we talked about before in the anti-aging cream is actually a form of vitamin A and it forms the chemical basis of animal vision. So without this, you cannot see. And vitamin A deficiency is responsible for you know, a lot of preventable blindness. 
in the third world. Um, testosterone is a ketone. We can see the ketone functional group here. It's a sex hormone. Um, it regulates sex drive, bone mass, fat distribution, muscle mass, and strength, and also the production of red blood cells and sperm. Progesterone, which is a female sex hormone, has two ketone groups. Can you see the very close relationship structurally between those two hormones? So progesterone is released by the ovaries and it can it contributes to normal menstrual cycle. Um, progesterone also is necessary for implantation of fertilized eggs in the uterus and also for maintaining pregnancy. Then we have cortisone, which is an adrenal hormone. We see a few ketone groups in that molecule. And you'll find that in um, many, many medicinal products. Now, aldehydes and ketones are even responsible for changing your behavior. Meet the pheromones. So a pheromone is simply a chemical that the body excretes that triggers some sort of social response in members of the same species. There's different types. There are alarm pheromones, food trail pheromones, sex pheromones, and many others. And they can affect your behavior or in fact your physiology. Now, as far as insects go, sex pheromones are used in insect traps. So if we have a look here at the pheromone that's the honeybee sex pheromone, we can see the ketone group there. We can also see a carboxylic acid group on that molecule, but that will definitely attract honeybees. And so if you wanna attract some honeybees, you place some of this compound into the trap and they'll fly right into it. Uh, we have chemical compounds being used as trail pheromones by ants, and we see the aldehydes and the ketones make up a great many of those. But one I think you'll be particularly interested in is androstenedione, as this molecule here. Now, the jury is really out as to whether human pheromones exist. I've read articles that say they don't and articles that report that they that this particular compound has a really potent pheromone-like effect in humans. So it's been reported to affect the mood of heterosexual women. They did an experiment where they had um, some subjects in the experiment that were exposed to this compound uh, just under their nose and some that weren't. And then they showed them a whole heap of pictures of buildings, believe it or not. But the ones who were exposed to this compound reported those buildings as looking much more friendly and much more attractive than those who weren't exposed to that. Okay, so apparently it doesn't alter behavior a great deal, but it might have some subtle effects on attention. Believe it or not, it's commonly sold in male fragrances because it's supposed to increase the sexual attraction of the male who's wearing it. There you go. Maybe there is a lynx effect after all. So that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed learning about the aldehydes and the ketones. I found it particularly interesting researching for this video. If you did find it interesting or if you found it helpful, then please consider giving the video a like. And as always, if you would like to learn about more fascinating chemistry, then please subscribe to my channel. I'm gonna see you guys in the next video.